All of us at the Dub Network would like to thank the crew at Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Harps Court. Herman Marshall Small Batch Whiskey is handcrafted and award-winning, and whether it be their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. And make sure you check out their amazing tasting room in Wiley, Texas, if you get a chance. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. It's a great place to pop on in, enjoy one of their specialty drinks or two, or for hosting special occasions like birthday parties, mixers, weddings, or receptions. Thank you so much, Herman Marshall. Here we go again. Welcome to Harps Court. I'm your host, Derek Harper. My co-host, John Radigan. How you doing, Rags? And what, what, what do you have for me? Man, I'm doing great, Harp. I'm so glad to be back on Harps Court. Yeah. I was afraid, you know, they might relegate me to sixth man or, or twelfth man role. So I'm, I'm good, man. I feel <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I've, I've accomplished something. I'm back on Harps Court. And go. I think it's awesome, man, that, you know, again, we started this a little bit before the NBA season was set to begin, and I know yeah. it's just training camp and all that. We got ways to go yet, but basically, once they go to training camp, Harp, it's time to start NBA basketball again. That's an exciting time of year. You know, it is very exciting. And what stands out to me when you start talking about this time of the year, the fair is coming soon, and yeah. I can go to <laughs> I can go out to the state fair and 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 eat good and all of that different stuff, but. I, I'm looking forward to this season when it comes to the Mavericks. They, uh, I think, addressed a lot of problem areas, if you would. Give Nico, Q, uh, Michael Finley, give those guys a lot of credit because I think this is a different roster and shit. If you you think about having Luka and Kyrie, the best duo right. to me in the NBA, Maverick fans should be getting excited right about now. Yeah, I agree, and it's going to be fun to watch them through training camp, of course, and obviously the, the preseason games, and then, wow, it gets going in the regular yeah. season. It's really going to be great. We'll have, we'll have so much time to talk about uh, the Mavs and the NBA, but i got to go back uh, to the fair because i got to know, Harp, <laughs> what's your – like, do you have a go-to on the fried foods? You know what? I'm going to be honest with you, JR. I can't afford – to eat a lot of fried food. Six, so we're the same age. So yeah. I, I come from bad genes. My mother, high blood pressure, diabetes, things of that nature. So I'm kind of slow to it, but I, I've had anything from a fried ice cream sandwich to fried corn. I mean, I, I've had a lot of different things out there. But I try yeah. to stay away from it most of the time, yeah. to be honest with I, you. I don't blame you. Of course, whenever I go, which is usually every year, I got to get a corny dog, a Fletcher's corny dog. There's uh, nothing course. like it. But And then, of course, I do enjoy uh, tasting some of the unique items that they bring to the table each mm -hmm. and every year. But I'll never forget the first one was the deep fried Oreo. Oh, and Daniel Larson, um, my, my colleague at Bally, who you know well, too, Dana yeah. and I were out there taping the show. And uh, so, I, you know, for the purposes of a, of a show we were doing, we just kind of take one bite. Yeah, you know, and Dana's, yeah, all, yeah. Dana's all healthy. Yeah, J Dana's all healthy and skinny and stuff. So she takes her <laughs> bite and she goes, OK, we got done taping. And she goes, OK. And she's like setting it aside. And I go, you're not going to eat that? She said, "Oh no, I, I don't. I don't eat so. Oh my God, I ate both of them. Man, I'm licking the powdered sugar off the. Ra I don't even like Oreos, Harp. The right. deep fried Oreo. Oh right. my gosh, that's one of the best the things Oreo. I've I ever eaten. I, I did try the fried Oreo before too. That, yeah, that was. That's a, I, I'll just say it was different. Different from what I yeah. expected. Yeah, yeah, way way different because again, Oreos crispy." But then once they deep fry it, it's all soft like a mm -hmm. donut. Oh, my gosh. It Turns was fantastic. into something else. So, You're exactly right. Yeah, it really does. It really does. But, yeah. yeah, so let's talk about some of the hottest topics of the week since the NBA is just kind of getting started right yes, now. Sir. And really, the hot hottest topic of the month really has to be Dion Sanders. I know you know Dion very yeah, I well. I know Dion I as well. And um, 
just to watch what this man has done, Harp, when he basically went into Colorado and and broomed everybody, right? He gave him an yeah. opportunity, if you, you know, and I loved his comments on, on 60 Minutes. He told those guys, if you... If you want it, if you don't want to stay, if we give you some pushback and you go, then we didn't want you anyway. Right. And and the guys that did stay proved to him they're your type of guys, Dion, because they yeah. did fight through that and and they did stay. Still, only well, eight or nine or ten guys transferred, you know, stayed with him from the previous year, yeah. and all the others are new. And he has pulled this all together with a, a magnificent start to the season. Yeah, which is amazing. I don't think anybody coming into this season, college football, expected him to be where he is. Very unique individual. When you talk about Deion Sanders, better known as Primetime, prime time, you know, he, he has a history. He has a unique history. He, you know, didn't have a father. Uh that was in his life present. His mother worked throughout of her life to uh, throughout his young life to provide for the family. And I think all he was taking receipts as he called them now back then, John, if you would to, uh, to kind of build himself into what he's built himself into. I think what he's doing is unprecedented and what he has is a team and a coaching staff and a, uh, I know Rick George, the AD there. Rick and mm-hmm. I were at the University of Illinois together, believe it or not. And he and Prime, to me, are a great combination because Rick George is one of those free spirit, you know, go for it kind of a guy. Kind of a guy. And they have come together and put together a sensational team, obviously, led by Dion. But his son, I think, has proven to be legit as a leader, as a quarterback at this level because you come from Jackson State nobody is giving you a chance to do what Shador has been able to do uh, and it's a small sample size just three games and you don't want to get ahead of yourself but I just think the way he has captivated 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 the um, college the the world to be quite frank with you in college yeah. football has been uh, it's been phenomenal and must see TV. I'm looking forward to uh, Oregon State tomorrow at two thirty Central yeah. Time. Yeah, it's going to be a great game with Oregon, and I and I do want to say too, um, you know, that the appearance on sixty Minutes that I referenced, um, I kind of glossed over it. Our, you and I both know that's a huge deal, right? To be like, you either really want to be on sixty Minutes. Or you really don't want to be on sixty minutes, right? <laughs> if they're investigating you. So so but obviously, you know, in Dion's case, it's a, a yeah, I really want to. I want to spread the good word yeah. about what we're doing here, right? And yeah. the and the intro to that sixty minutes piece a week or so ago um was all about the the reporter saying we don't profile people two times in one year, but we're profiling Deion Sanders again because of all the things he's accomplished. So within the last year, he was on 60 Minutes at Jackson State. Yeah. Now, early in the season, he's on 60 Minutes again at Colorado. Yeah. Really an amazing thing, and I think that, to your point, uh, Harp, is why this is bigger than college football, right? He's captured the imagination of you know, of the of the populace like wow what is what is this guy doing yeah, and every, how is he doing it everybody right now is interesting and interested in what's going on in Colorado right now and you got to put Dion right at the forefront of all of it of course you know Dion is a leader of men he was a leader at at when he played in the NFL when he played in college when he played baseball same kind of same kind of deal He has a way of galvanizing an organization and turning it into something extremely positive. And he talks about not drinking, not smoking, having a positive impact in life for these young guys. And they have taken the the ball by the horn and they have followed him and they're having a lot of success. I'm a big time prime fan because uh, he does it the right way. And think about this, John, if you would. You leave Jackson State, right? And you go to Colorado. You you get your opportunity there. And you get rid of basically everybody there. 
guys that he didn't feel like fit the bill. And you start the season off against TCU. You find a way to beat them. Then you get all of the, the whole world interested in what, what, what the formula is, if you would, for a guy like Dion to be so successful and everything that he touches turns to gold pretty much. You know, that, that, that's, that's, Gavin, that, that's really do, doing a great job of galvanizing the country more than anything. And then, of course, you're going to have people out there that don't like the way you go about doing right. what you do. And there are a ton of critics out there that don't think that he's gone about it the right way. And when you look at all of that, that's just double trouble. But Deion Sanders is the last person that I think you want to come for because he has such an opportunity as far as uh, being one of these guys that, that understands marketing and all of those different things. He's a son. He had everybody wearing sunglasses, if you would, yeah, before the game last week. So to me, that's fascinating. He's a very fascinating character as a, as a person. Yeah, and, and to your point about that, I think what he does is just market. And look, he's always marketed himself right. in, a, in a grand way. Right. And now he is marketing, you know, these kids, right? And he is out there in front of everybody. He is the one uh, that's forefront, even though Shadur is probably going to be a Heisman Trophy candidate all season he long. He is already, Trap- yes. Yep, Travis Hunter, same thing. The guy plays two ways. You know, back in the TCU game, I think he played nearly 100 plays. I mean, uh-huh. it's amazing what these guys are doing. But Dion still, I think, is able to take a spotlight off of them uh, to a certain extent and put it on him. Is yeah. that, in your experience, Harp, is that a good thing for a coach to, to do that, to deflect some of that attention from the young men and and put it on himself. Well, I I, I don't think it's a distraction. I, I think he strategically planned things out, Jr. If you would, in the, his approach, the kids are going to be perfectly fine because now you got to remember this: for the first time in college sports, college athletes are being compensated. Yep. That's a lot to bear. That's a lot to deal with. But I think the reason why he's taking the focus totally off of them is for that reason. Maybe they're too immature and young to deal with what's going on. I mean, I, answer me this, John. Do you think that it's a, a, a distraction for Little Wayne, The Rock, Michael yeah. Irvin, <laughs> Michael Irvin, Terrell Owens, these guys are not only around the team, but they're down on the field while these guys are playing. When they come off of the when the offense comes off of the field, that's what they see. That's what they interact with. I'll ask you, in your opinion, is that a distraction? I'm really curious. I will, yeah, for I will say, I will say uh, obviously that it could be. Yeah. But I will also say that those kids who would be the ones who would be distracted by that have a great mentor and a great coach in Dion who there you go. who experienced all of it. If you remember back in the day, Harp, and I was on the sidelines with the Cowboys in these days when yeah. Dion was playing, when Michael was playing, there were princes from Saudi Arabia on the sidelines who Jerry was working business deals with, and they were coming in the locker room. Gary Busey, the the actor at the time, was always a huge Cowboys fan, right? The Cowboys had uh, a a similar entourage around them when they were, uh, again, reinvigorated there in the 90s with the triplets and that whole team. And I believe you learn, you know, a a method of handling that. And in Dion's case, I believe he has obviously been able to uh, tell the kids, this is how you deal with that. Yeah, when it comes to marketing, I think they're under the same umbrella. Dion, not close to what Jerry has been able to do uh, since being with the Cowboys as far as marketing his organization. It's the number one franchise in professional sports, right? Is it perfect? Is it straight down the road? No, it's not. You get off the beaten path sometimes, but I think the kids are built for it. 
because they're playing for Hall of Fame coaches. Warren Sapp is an assistant coach, a defensive coordinator for Colorado. Deion Sanders, Hall of Famer. They've been around it, and it's second nature, in my opinion, John, for these guys to go about their business in spite of what's going on. And like you said, it could be a distraction if you don't have the right guys, if you have guys that not quite ready for that 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 Super Bowl status, that that other stratosphere status as as individuals and as players, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna say it, man. I, I think Prime has done a done a, a. I don't think anybody could have did what he's done so far in his first year as a head coach. He's changed yeah. the whole, you know, the, the the whole thing when it comes to college football. Yeah, he, he didn't crawl his way up or claw or climb. He just raced Jumped his in. way to yeah. basically the top, right? You're you're in a you're in a power five conference and, right. and it's gonna be so much fun that they're in the big twelve after this year. It'll be fun to have Colorado back, especially with Brian with there. What's wrong yeah, with it, no, right? It's, it's, Everything it's, changes. I mean Yeah. You know, and I think the the reason that people are starting to make noise and fuss about the style of prime time. Yeah. It's it's envy is what I would say. I mean, Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, those guys have been in front of the big stage for so long until people don't question them. And I think if you continue to look look at prime time, he's not harming anybody. He's simply giving his guys a will, a method, a um, a mindset, if you would to go out, think that you're great, prepare to be great, and simply go out there and kick butt. I'm not sure yeah. what's going to happen in tomorrow's game. I think it'll be the biggest challenge that Colorado has faced. But I, I do believe this, that Colorado will show up and make it a competitive game because that's who Prime is. That's, who, that's how he holds his players accountable and what he holds them accountable to is to show up and do what you do as a player. And they have a lot of talent. I think that's going yeah. unnoticed because of all the other distractions that's going on in Boulder, in Colorado. Yeah, and you know, when you mention the people who are rubbed the wrong way by Dion's style and by his yeah. approach and by his bravado, right, and he's so out there and so forced uh, – um, I, I hate to say it, Hart, but I, I fear that a lot of that could be drawn down racial lines. And I, I don't like that for our country. Yeah. And I, I feel like there are old white guys. I'm one and I don't feel this way at all. But I think there's plenty of them who are out there going, this isn't how you do it. This isn't how you do it. Well, guess well, what? You, you can Deion go Sanders. Pod. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Dion's I'm sorry. proving. Dion's proving this is how you do it, or at least this is one way to do it. And to your <laughs> point, Harp, I love that he loves these kids. That's what yeah. Dabo Sweeney and and Saban do too. He loves these kids, and he's you know raising them up to to reach their highest potential. So you 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 threw race in the game, right? Which is yeah. perfectly fine. I, I think we need to talk about it. He's not doing anything that Saban hasn't done, that Swinney hasn't done, that all of the greats haven't done. You, you have to promote your program. And we're, we're not living in those old ages that you, you were just alluding to, right? It's a new day. It's a new situation. For crying out loud, college players are now being compensated. They're being compensated, big bucks, to, to play college football. So with that comes a lot of scrutiny. You know that. But I think everything is falling into place the proper way. Um, you know, you, you're going to be hated. And a lot of it, success breeds that. When, when you're successful, people, they love to hate success. I mean, yep. think about the Bulls. Think about... The Lakers, the Celtics, when they were successful, you either loved those guys and most of their fan base loved them, but everybody else hated them because of the, their, the success factor. And that's just part of it. I think Deion Sanders is the kind of coach 
and will recruit the kind of guys that he'll be able to reach from a mental standpoint and help them to understand that's that's just part of it. And I think Prime will continue to be successful because he gets it. He walks to a different drum or a different beat, beg your pardon. And that's just what it is, man. Success breeds hate everywhere you go. I don't know why. Yeah. I, I wish I could, you know, say why that is, but you know, jealousy and envy is a real thing, man. Yeah, it really is. So uh, let's take one more little, uh, you know, avenue on the Dion topic here, yeah. Harp. Uh, Jerry, jo- you mentioned Jerry Jones. Yes, sir. And Jerry had said uh, after maybe his second or third game, oh, I, in fact, I think it was after that Colorado State game, which went so late at night. Yeah. Jerry's like, I watched that one to the very end. He got watched every minute of Dion. And Jerry said after the game, the Cowboys game that week, he said uh, that yeah, that man is going to, he's going to be a great coach in the NFL someday. So mm. I wonder what you think. That means is, Jerry, that means Jerry is going to, going to look to hire uh, prime as a coach. That's all that means. You know, you know, Jerry. You heard, yeah. You, you heard it here first. You heard That's it here right. first. So, hard no, story. I That's mean, right. but, but, uh, again, the way he uh, comports himself is awesome with the kids, right? He, he really has a great uh, touch with them. Can you do that with guys that are making 40 and 50 and by then, who knows, whenever he gets here, $60 challenge. million? Dollars? Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. certainly more of a challenge. I mean, let's be real. When you start talking about coaching top 19, 20-year-old guys opposed to what you just talked about, guys that are a little more mature if you would, but I think if anybody can, Deion Sanders can, um, it's about respect. And I, I don't think you can find a lot of people that if you ask them about Deion Sanders, the man, the motivator, the coach, not many guys are going to be able to, to, to really say a lot of bad about the way he has done things might not be to your liking uh, as a coach, and that that back then was back then. Times have changed, and that's exactly what he's holding his hat on. Every time you hear him talk, time times have changed. He puts fear, he says, into, and I, I'm quoting him. He says, a confident black man gives people pause. That's Deion Sanders. That's what he said. And he's not talking bad about people. He's not talking bad about Nick Saban or anybody else, but he's doing it his way. And so far, John, you have to admit it's been pretty good. The question I have is for Dion and for his players is when things don't go your way, are you going to be able, how are you going to deal with that and handle that? You know, because the scrutiny is here. But so far, Prime and his team have been able to get through it. What happens if they get beat tomorrow by a big, a large margin, right? People are coming. They're coming for them. You, you, you watch on Twitter, on, on, on all of the, the, the media outlets, they're going to come for him. They're going to say they weren't prepared. You know, there were guys when the season started said he didn't have enough talent to do anything. Those guys are going to come back. And I'm really interested, Rats, in how Dion, his players, Colorado responds to that. This is what makes this story so fascinating, Harp, because tomorrow they are 21 point that's, underdogs that's if right. you look in the paper, right? I saw that. I saw that. When they, when they took the field against TCU, they were 21 point underdogs, yeah. right? So, and I believe so far, again, short sample, but so far, Dion's done a masterful job of the us against them mentality. Nobody believes in us mentality, right? right. I think it, it, it prevailed. It prevailed against TCU, and I know this. That's a um, uh, and and Dion was not here uh, as a part of the Cowboys under Jimmy Johnson. Right, but right. that was a big that was a big player in Jimmy Johnson's you know uh, deck of cards as well. Uh, nobody believes in us. Cowboys had won you know a Super Bowl, or nobody believes in. Them. What are you kidding me? We want the Super Bowl, but he would sell them on 
hey, it's us against them. Nobody believe, right. believe in you out there. And Dion's done a great job at that. So, you know, let's see. And I do believe that has a shelf life, Hart, right? At some point, the players will finally go, ah, I, I think they do believe in us, coach, you know, and at that point, Dion will switch, right? He'll he'll come to another method of motivating his guys. But I think for now, it's still that us against them, nobody believes in us mentality. I can tell you from past experience, JR, that that's where you want to be with nothing to lose but everything to gain, if you would. Me against the world. I mean, you find, you dig deeper, when it's you against the world, wouldn't you agree that Absolutely. You, you find a way to dig a little bit deeper and get a little bit more out of yourself, if you would? And I mean, we're sitting here talking prime. I don't think we have to worry about Deion Sanders. I really don't. Mm-hmm. Or or Colorado, mm-hmm. because this is the first year you get to recruit. Re- if there's what, seven and five, or 12 games, right? If they're seven and five after this year and they come back next year, they still have something to build on and they still have wiggle room to grow as a, as a university. And I think that they will. I don't see Colorado going backwards long-term from here. They won one game last year, right? Yep. One game. They've already, they've, they've already won three. So I think I, I, I think the best is yet to come for prime time and for Colorado as far as uh, the future holds. Yeah, yeah, and I think to your point, you were saying how people gravitate toward Dion. I think anybody who knows him, yeah. as we do, anybody who knows him, you, you, if you get to know him, you, you get him. Yeah. A lot more, right? I, I, you realize think, this yeah. a good man. I, I think a great man. I, I, I really do. Um, just have unique leadership qualities. Um, I'm not going to follow anybody, but if I, I if I if I I, I I I see a guy worth following, then I will follow him. And I think that's where these young kids are. You know, we we mm-hmm. we, we just finished talking about whether or not. The kids can handle it. What's there to handle? You're being coached by a Hall of Fame cornerback. People didn't even throw at Deion Sanders. Right, right. They didn't throw his way. I mean, he was really over there just relaxing his whole career because they were so afraid of him. So the stage is never going to be too big for the guys that he's going to be able to go out and recruit. And let's go. Let's go, Buff. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a fan. I wasn't a fan, I should say, but I am now because I like the story of Dion. Uh, you know, us against the world, um, changing the narrative of how you do things. I like that because life is is all about change. You have to adjust in life yeah. to work for you, and Dion has has been fabulous at, at that so far. All right, so speaking of adjustments, let us talk <laughs> about uh, Jerry Jones' team that we were yeah, referencing yeah. Jerry a minute ago. And, you know, a week ago or so, they lost, you know, a Pro Bowl yeah. cornerback in Trayvon Diggs. Yeah, and that just, is just such recently, a huge right? blow. Yeah, that, yeah, yesterday was the day that he actually got hurt. Mm-hmm. And uh, a, a ACL, right? Mm. An ACL, which means you are out for the season. Um, you know that that's just yeah. a done deal. It's a 12 to 13 month recovery process for, for, I know for NBA guys, yeah. it's like a 12 month, 13 month. I think football players can get back a little sooner, but as soon as that ACL has gone, which happened in practice, um, the season's over, man, that first of all, it's heartbreaking for the athlete, isn't yeah. it? No question about it. Um, I, I'll, I'll take you back a week. Same thing. It wasn't an ACL, but it was a uh, it was a hamstring for the 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 great Aaron Rodgers. Yep. And just what the Jets had to do, the Cowboys are going to have to do as well. They're going to have to adjust. You know, we 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 say when there's an injury in professional sports, next man up. After all, you get paid if you're a cornerback. 
You get paid to defend the greatest wide receivers in the NFL, right? So that's what's going to have to happen. I mean, you, it's it, it's a rallying cry, if you would, for the rest of the guys. I, you know what I think? I think the reason that I felt like the Cowboys, I feel, I still feel like it can be in the Super Bowl, was because of their defense. I mean, they're the Absolutely. stingiest freaking team in 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 the NFL. I mean, you, it's just hard to score against those guys. You're not going to get anything easy. You think about Parsons and what he's what he's become as a young talent in the NFL. They're just built to be – if there's any team in the NFL that's capable of overcoming such a significant loss, I think the Cowboys are able to do that. They're, they're just that deep, that good. Won't be as easy as it was because I think teams are strategic enough in the NFL to target a weakness – and it's certainly a weakness, if you would, not having Diggs back there. And um, you wish him well, speedy recovery, but the Cowboys are going to be okay. They, 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 they're they built to overcome adversity like this. Yeah, it makes you happy that in the offseason they went and got Stephon Gilmore. Gilmore yeah. His own team, yeah, his own teammate, C.D. Lamb, said this is the smartest uh, uh, you know, defensive back I've ever faced because he just knows what what I'm going to do, and yeah. if I ever beat him once, it'll never happen again, right? So, yeah. and Gilmore's that type of guy. He's got that type of experience. You're right, though. You know, if you moved Deron Bland over there, there's a there's a loss. You can't you replace can't. you can't replace a guy who's a there. Pro Bowl. Not you that kind of talent, but what yeah. intelligence, experience, rats. To your point will definitely help you to get through it. And I, I, I'll say this, you know, there are all, in sports, you don't ever, as a, as a competitor, you're never hoping that a guy gets hurt, right? However, you're looking for your opportunity. Yeah. So here's an opportunity for backup corners for the Cowboys. Here's an opportunity for you. Careful what you ask for. You think you want it yeah. until, you, until you get it. And when you get it, you better cash in because it will it, it will decide how long you're an NFL player in a lot of cases. All right. So uh, from your experience, different game, but you've had similar experiences where you lose a great player. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned Micah Parsons. Is there a concern that a Micah or anyone else on that defense will begin to try to do a little too much always. in order to compensate. Always. That's always the case. But I'd rather you try to do too much than to be complacent. Roy Tarpley, yeah. what I played with here in Dallas, we lost him because of, um, we know the reasons why, because of drug yeah. problems and things, yeah. a, a disease is what I always talk about when yeah. I talk about Tarpley right. and his yep. situation. He just couldn't couldn't kick it unfortunately. And Roy was 20 and 12. Easy. Getting out of the bed. So we, we, we lost a lot in that situation. It's a similar situation with the Cowboys. They're losing a lot in digs, but you have to find a way not to act like it didn't happen. It happened, but you have to find a way to, uh, to rebound from it, not feel sorry for yourself, because I guarantee you the hate for the Cowboys, I mean, it's real. And the love, don't get me wrong. But people, everybody doesn't want to see the Cowboys do well. So they're not going to gonna, gonna have that a pity patty party with the Cowboys and feel sorry for them. They're going to have to get up and they're going to have to go. Starting Sunday against Arizona. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, when, you, when you look at a, a defensive unit, it's 11 guys, right? It seems like, um, compared to your five in the NBA, right, it seems like there are more opportunities to make up for this loss, right? I, it, I, it, I would it, agree. And, and, yeah. and the other thing I think that goes unnoticed a lot of times is a guy like Dan Quinn. Yeah. Probably the best defensive coordinator in the NFL. I mean, you can argue that. He, he had success in Atlanta um, as a head coach there. Very successful very strategic when it comes to game planning 
And I, I think the thing that I see just from my, my little football knowledge is that his guys are prepared and they believe in their scheme defensively, which is blitz, rush the quarterback all the time. You, you, if you watch the game the other against the Giants, they were coming. Yeah, they were coming every night, and I think you're going to see more of that uh, uh, when, when with uh, Diggs being injured. You're going to see more of that. The off the defensive line, you're going to see some 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 different kind of stuff, some different kind of attacking from the Cowboys now that they've lost such a sensational talent in Trayvon Diggs. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be. It's really, it's really going to be fun. I mean, I think they were almost a, a shoe in to be the number one defense in the league. Yet again, San Francisco is always going to have something to say about yeah. that. But uh, I think they they had a really good shot at it. Maybe they're not the number one defense in the league anymore. Okay, well that's fine as long as they're ranking high in that department. This yeah. offense looks like it's coming along really well too. Well, they're going to have to. Uh, Dak is going to have to get going. I, I think. If you look at it, it puts a little pressure on Dak. You you use the word, not try and do too much. That's where Dak is now. He's not trying to do too much, but their offense is gonna have to gonna have to step up. Because if you think about what, four turnovers last week for the Cowboys, um I, I against the uh, Giants, I think they had four or five turnovers as well. That's all good and dandy, but when you face good teams and the Cowboys have a, a difficult schedule. When you think about their schedule, they don't play chop oh, liver yeah. this year. They, it's a tough schedule, and when you get to the meat of your schedule, you got to score points. You you got to get the ball when you get in the red zone. You got to get the ball in the end zone for seven, six points. You can't settle for field goals. And I think the first two games, that's kind of a, a concern for Dak, for the offense, of Coach, of Co- McCartney. Of course, he's calling plays this year, which is a new wrinkle for the Cowboys yep. offense, but you got to go for it, man. You you got to go yeah. for it. I don't think many people are going to jump off of the Cowboy wagon because they're no. that, that, that good and that talented. Yeah. And I did like, you know, you were kind of mentioning how even if Colorado goes seven and five this year, that'll be something to work on, right? Something to be better. So the Cowboys win 30 to 10 over the jets. Yep. And that's, that's all anybody on the offense would talk about after the game was, Man, we, we can't settle for those field goals. We got it, oh. you know, they only put it in the end zone twice. And they were like, we can't be settling for those field goals. They won by 20 points, but yeah. I appreciated the fact that they were looking to get better. Who does that fall on? To, to me, it falls on the head coach and the quarterback. They're connected at the hip, right? McCartney took the took took the 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 stand of they lost a great uh offensive coordinator by the way, too, right? So McCartney starts to call the plays. He and Dak have a great rapport from what I understand. Just listen to Clarence Hill and different people. They have a great rapport. So that has to be the, one of the mainstays for what the Cowboys are going to be as a, uh, as a team offensively. I still think that the best is yet to come. CeeDee Lamb, you know, Pollard, all of those guys, their offensive line, I think they'll find a way to uh, to get it done moving forward. I wouldn't be surprised if this week they kind of open up the can and, and 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 show what they're capable of being as an offensive team. Yeah, it's going to be a fun season, I think, no matter what. And everybody else is going to have to deal with injuries at some point down the season, too. So we know that's, you know, you're only mm-hmm. as good as how deep you are, right? Because the next injury I mean, they, uh, could, be the, could be the one. You know? Yeah, the Giants lost uh, the, uh, the the Saquon. Saquon Barkley, yeah. yeah, they lost him last week. I mean, that injury board is not nothing nice, but to your point, it's certainly a part of the game, and you got to find a way to rebound from it. I think when every team, every organization in the NFL, when they build their roster, I think they're building it with depth uh, as an organization in, in case of injuries. It's not if, it's when they strike right. Yeah, that, you know, you can rebound and you can move forward and, and be the kind of uh, the, the, the kind of team and have the kind of success that you plan to have when you uh, when you started 
in training camp. So speaking of a team whose whose plan um, <laughs> may be different now than it was during not training camp, we call it spring training for baseball. But <laughs> the Texas Rangers, man, I played baseball this season, by the way before you. Before, oh, I, yeah, I, I played a I'm, little baseball. It, you wouldn't believe it, but I batted fourth. I was I was a good batter. That eye hand coordination came in handy in my day. But carry on, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I, I believe it. I believe first of all, quick aside on that. I believe a professional athlete can beat me, just a regular guy, in any sport, any time. You've never picked up a tennis racket, oh, I and I play tennis. all the time. Yeah. Okay, so you did anyway. But even if you hadn't, right? Or if you've never picked up a golf club, which I know you play that too. I say, no, no, no. I've seen so I, I many. I go out there. No, let's not get oh, carried okay. away. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't play okay. golf. That's a lot. I love golf. Um, and yeah. just like a lot of people, especially athletes, Tiger Woods came onto the scene and we all jumped out there thinking yeah. we can play golf too. But I love yeah. golf, but I don't think what I do out there is called playing. And we'll get out there okay. soon. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I appreciate I'm sure you were a good uh, baseball player and, yeah. and football, if you did that too, I for did. that matter. But um, yeah, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, uh, as far as uh, this Rangers group goes, it's been a roller coaster ride, man. And yeah. like we're hanging on for this final 10 games of the season, just going, Is whoa, it 10 or 11? Are we going to. 10 left, 10 left. They, 10 got, left. Okay. they got seven. They got seven with the uh, Mariners and three with the Angels. And, and you know, like, we, we asked Bochi about that just the other day. We said, uh, you know, this we just got to kind of hang on to this roller coaster ride, right? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And he goes, man, I can't believe how far down we've gone. But then we climb back up, you know, yeah. and um, it is it's and most of the roller coaster, honestly, Harp has been in the second half of the season. Yes, and much yes, of yes. that, much of that has to be due to the injuries that they, you know, to you had pitching. six all stars. Yeah, you had six all stars and five of the six have been injured in the second half of the season. That's that's just really hard to overcome. Well, we're talking about a similar situation with the with the Cowboys and, and Diggs. Yeah. Can you overcome the injuries? And I, I think the Rangers have done a tremendous job of yeah. staying afloat, if you would. Um, we, we talked earlier, and one of the problems I think the Rangers have moving towards the postseason right now is their bullpen. Yeah. I, I just don't think they have enough there. I mean, even if they get a, get hot – Hitting, you still got to get out, right? That, that if you think about all the great playoff runs, the thing that sticks out and that's in the it, it, right in the forefront of everything is being able to get people out. And I think you will see it with the Rangers. That's probably going to be their biggest challenge if they can hit and and and, and be solid from that standpoint. They still have a chance. And the, the, the good news is that you play the same team. So you know what you're facing. You play the same team seven out of what did you say, 10? Yeah. Yeah. And right now, I think yeah. the Rangers are, they are third, if I'm not mistaken, behind Seattle and behind uh, Houston. Actually, as they start the series with yeah. Seattle, the and it's it's basically a seven game series in a way. It basically is yeah. the playoffs starting now. But uh, as they start the series, he, uh, Seattle and the Rangers have exactly the same record. So yeah. technically, they're both tied for third. Is probably how it would be listed, and they're both just a half game behind Houston. So yes. it's going to be super, super, super exciting and interesting to see how it goes down the stretch. But to your point about that, of getting those outs in the playoffs yeah. and, and the most important out, like we all say, game one is every bit as important as game 162 or one eight, game one is the same as game 80. The most important out in a game, in a game of baseball, is that 27th out. Right. Yes. <laughs> and you've got to have somebody who can get that 27th out. Yeah. And the Rangers, unfortunately, I mean, I thought in the middle of the season, I thought, wow, 
You know, they had Josh Boards going really well, and then Aroldis Chapman came in, and, and he finished, the, you know, worked the eighth inning, and then Will Smith was looking like the closer that he used to be uh, back in the day, and I was like, man, they've got it. They've got a seventh, eighth, and ninth that, you know, they can't be, and then all of a sudden, the wheels came off of that, and suddenly... Harp, this team reminds me a little bit of the 96 team. That was the first Rangers team that ever made the playoffs. Yes. And they were a great team. They Top to bottom in that line. It might have been a I'm better trying to remember, lineup. Was, was Wash the, the, the manager that year? No. Back then, that was Johnny Oates. Johnny Oates. In, okay, in the there very, you go. There yeah, you the go. Very, yeah, the very first year of their yeah. playoff run, yeah, yeah. it was Johnny Oates. And, um, and, and one through nine, you know, that's our buddy Mark McLemore was on that team right. and Juan and Pudge and, you know, all those guys. And then the ninth place hitter in that order was was Kevin Elster, um, right. a supposedly light hitting shortstop. And Kevin Elster drove in 99 runs that year. Right. So, man, one through nine, they had a great batting order that year. And they had really good pitching that year, too. In fact, at the trade deadline that year, they went and got John Burkett, which even enhanced their pitching that you know for that postseason run. But what happened is win game one in New York, blow a save in game two in New York, blow a save in game three here, series. And then uh, I think that the, the, the fourth game was just, uh, you know, just not one that included yeah. the save. But you had aging men in the bullpen, Mike Henneman, who had been a great closer, yeah. and Jeff Russell, who had been a great closer. But at that point in their career, they didn't quite have it as much it, anymore. And, yeah. and you can't overcome that. And that's what I fear we might see from the Rangers this yeah. year. Let, Will let me, Smith yeah. and Aroldis, you know, long in the two. Let me, let me ask you this. In your opinion, you said uh, – Houston has a half a game lead starting today, yeah. right? The game is at seven tonight. What separates, in your opinion, Rat, Houston from those two teams? Uh, experience. They, yeah. They've done it all been and, there and been done there. It. And and they, they know, I mean, like when the Rangers were, were in a bad way when Houston came in for the last series of the season between the two clubs in the middle uh, of yeah. August, um, Man, the Astros just put a hurt on the Rangers, just yeah. beating them by double digits almost every day. And, um, you know, it was a little bit demoralizing. And I think it was absolutely a way of the Astros among themselves saying, OK, we got to send a message here. Uh -huh. We know how to do this. We know what to do. And I think they pulled, you know, pulled some of that postseason focus into that series right then. And um, so I think that's the that's the biggest difference between the two. Last year, Seattle made a run, got to the playoffs, ended the longest playoff drought in major sports history. Yeah. Uh, but um, but didn't advance, didn't do you know, didn't didn't did win like they were in the World Series. But they um, they learned a little bit of how to do that. You know this. You have to learn how to win. And um, and the Rangers have proven they can win in the regular season, but learning to win in the postseason could be a completely different animal. Yeah, and I, I think coaching, you have that, or the manager, you have that in both. I mean, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, he yeah. has so much experience. I think it'll yeah. really come in into play. You know, I, I'm loving Harps Court with John Radigan on with me. I'm really enjoying this. You know, you and I have known each other for a long time. We've been around each other for a long time. You had a story uh, with me talking about your, your first experience here. Yeah, yeah. So all of that, man, make, makes for a lot of conversation and a lot of fun. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you coming on and being a part of what I'm trying to do as far as Harps, Harps court, court is concerned. And we're going to continue to move forward. But more importantly, we're going to have some fun, man. Yeah, we're, we're I love it. And I, I, I love your thoughts. I love your opinions and I love your experience. Yeah. And of course, we haven't really in the in the two podcasts yet. We haven't really even dabbled in your expertise because, yeah. you know, we it's not to. NBA season yeah, yet. Yeah. We, but we, we will. We will. Yeah. And everybody will know and everybody will hear the stories about, you know, about what you've done and, and what you accomplished. And every, yeah. most people re remember and realize yeah, yeah. if they're watching this. But it's significant, man, yeah, and it's uh, it's my that. pleasure to be on here with you. I I I, I just uh, I've really enjoyed it too, Harp. It's been great. Yeah, and until next time on Harp's Court, we'll see you later.